Frida scratched her head and Hecky reached irritably for the garden shears. Really, having to deal with witches of such poor quality was hard. But what about you? asked Madame Rosalia. How are you going to get there? Hecky simpered. I shall descend from on high, eh? I shall float down in one of Boris's hot air balloons, said Hecky, waving a hand at the mechanical wizard and feeling more like Napoleon than ever. And remember, not a word to the children till it's all over. We wizards and witches may be bulletproof, but not the children. Nobody liked the sound of this at all. It was so long since any of them had done any proper magic that they had no idea whether they were bulletproof or not. But the cheese wizard had other worries too. Do they bite? He asked as he shuffled with the others to the door. Do what bite? Those uh, occupy things. I just wondered. Ralph Ticker was standing by the great hole he'd bulldozed the day before on the waste ground behind the sheds. He was waiting for Bert to come and chop off the heads of the birds and bury them. Once the hole was covered, there'd be nothing to show those Snoopy RSPCA people that there'd ever been hens in the place and he'd be safely away over the border. Only, where was Bert? He was late. Ticker's Porsche was parked in the drive. His case was packed, but he certainly wasn't going to kill 4,000 chickens by himself. What Ralph Ticker didn't know was that Bert had already done a bunk. He was sick of cutting the heads off chickens for peanuts, and he was sick of Ticker. While his employer waited by the death pit, Bert was on the pier at Brighton, playing the fruit machines. The wizards and witches, meanwhile, were driving down to Tricklington. It was an uncomfortable journey. They had to sit crowded together on the bench seat in the front because the van had been got ready for the okapi with padding on the walls and lots of straw. Boris, who had been unhappy, nature like most Russians, was worried about Hecky's hot air balloon. She had asked for a blue one to match the sky and he'd let her have it before he remembered that that was the one he'd been doing experiments on. Boris had always been sure one could invent a hot air balloon that flew on the hot air taught by politicians, but so far he hadn't managed it. And now he couldn't remember whether he'd put enough fuel back in the machine. By the time they reached the poultry unit, everyone was feeling ill-tempered and carsick. As for Mr. Gurgle, he wasn't just feeling sick, he was feeling extremely frightened, but he had said he would flush Mr. Ticker out of the poultry shed and flush he would, trying desperately to remember some useful spells. Mr. Gurgle crept towards the door. Cooey, he called, I see you. But he didn't at first see anything. He was very short-sighted and the shed was almost dark. Groping his way forward, he felt for his spectacles and put them on. But this was a mistake. Now he could see. Mr. Gurgle was not fond of chickens and had thought he didn't mind what happened to them. But he was wrong. As he reeled from cage to cage, his stomach heaved and sweat broke out on his forehead. Stumbling on, his foot hit a zinc bucket with a crack like a pistol shot and a large black rat carrying a chewed chicken leg scurried across his path. It was too much. Mr. Gurgle gave a cry of terror and fainted clean away. After this, things happened quickly, but not exactly the way Hecky had planned. Ralph Ticker heard the pistol shot, rushed into the shed, and saw a dead man, a gang fighting it out in his buildings. White with fear, he ran to the entrance, meaning to make a dash for his car, but a van was slewed across the road, and in it, a man with a long, cruel face. Ticker doubled back and straight into the arms of a ghastly gangster's mole. Come into the field, you dear man, leered Madame Rosalia. 
she fluttered her eyelashes so hard that they came off. And the chicken farmer, seeing what he thought was a black widow spider on his trousers, shrieked and bolted for the bridge. You can't come by. Not here you can't. Ticker stopped dead. A talking bush. A bush with a leafy top but two fat pink legs. Legs which ended in large green Wellington boots. But if Ticker was terrified of a bush in Wellies, he was even more frightened of the gangsters behind him. He pushed the bush violently to one side and set off across the bridge. The station was ahead now and safety. Only, what was that thing above him? A hot air balloon and coming down very fast, dangerously fast, it was going to land on top of him. Ticker crouched down on the planks trying to cover his head with his hands and then just as it seemed certain that he would be squashed flat, the balloon veered to one side and landed with a gigantic splash in the water. Ha ha ha, laughed Ticker, forgetting to run. He was the sort of man who loved to see people in trouble. But even as he leant over and jeered, something was coming up behind him. A bush in boots, which now lifted one leg and kicked him very hard on the backside. Whoosh! Blop! Guggle! spluttered the chicken farmer as he landed in the deep and icy water. And then a voice close by in the river. A kind voice like a nice nanny's. Don't worry, it said. I'll help you. I'll hold you. Just keep calm because I'm swimming right up to you and I'm going to hold you very tight. The journey back was not a happy one. Mr. Gurgle still felt faint and was lying down in the straw they had put down for the oak pea. Boris was full of gloom and guilt because of what had happened to the air balloon and Frieda's left foot was cold. All right, that's enough, snapped Hecky. She was soaking wet, but what she was worrying about was what was in Frieda's Wellington boot, which she was holding carefully on her lap. She had fill, filled it to the brim with water but even the best wellies leak a little. And if the poor dear fish that swam inside it should dry out and die before they reach Wellbridge, she would never forgive herself. So Frida's foot is cold. So Rosalia's lost her eyelashes. So you wanted an oak pea. I've told you, I can't go struggling about in the water with a kind of giraffe. They're poor swimmers giraffes, everyone says so. We understand that said madame rosalia no one's making a fuss because you turn mr ticker into a fish what we don't understand is why you didn't leave him where he was i told you why said hecky irritably because the river's polluted no fish could last in it for more than a couple of days well i can't see that it matters after what he did to those chickens Hecky opened her mouth and shut it again. She was absolutely sick of explaining to people that the second someone was a fish, he was not a wicked fish or a fish who had tortured chickens. He was simply a fish. Everything had gone really well. She had phoned the RSPCA and they promised to send some men at once to see to the hens and Ralph Ticker would never harm a living thing again but it wasn't much fun sharing adventures with these moaners and grumblers. If she'd had her old friend with her, how different it would have all been. Oh, where are you, Dora? sighed Hecky, clutching her watery boot. Chapter 10. Dora was sitting on an upturned chamber pot in the back of a swaying furniture lorry. Round her were all the things she had bought from Kitchester, her bed, her kitchen table and chairs, her workbench and her tools. She had decided to move to the outskirts of Wellbridge, where a nice garden statue business had come up for sale. And she was doing it in secret. She hadn't said a word to Hecky or to anyone she knew. After all, it might be that Hecky was going to be cross with her forever. On the other hand, if they lived in the same city, even at opposite ends of it, they just could meet by accident 
And then the lorry lurched round the corner and Dora clutched the metal jam pan which contained her hat. The hat wasn't well at all. The overfeeding had caused the snakes to start shedding their skins. If she wore it now, people would think she had the most awful dandruff. Should I put it on a diet, wondered poor Dora, as a lorry, lorry ground up the hill past Wellbridge Prison. But what sort of a diet was best for hats? It was Hecky who knew about animals. Come to that. I ought to go on a diet myself. It was true that Dora, who had never been thin, was now definitely overweight. People who are lonely often eat too much, and Dora had been really stuffing herself. Muscles, of course, are important for stonework, but that is another thing. Nothing had gone well for the stone witch in Kitchester. She'd managed to do some good all right. Dr Franklin, the one who'd done the awful experiments on dogs, really did look very nice by the fountain in the middle of the shopping centre. And she'd found a comfortable spot for a swindler who'd gone off with the life savings of a lot of poor people. He stood between two pillars in front of the pensions office where the starlings were enjoying him. But Kidchester wasn't pretty like Wellbridge. No, I'm lying, thought Dora. It's because I miss Hecky that I'm moving. It's because I miss my friend. They bumped over some old tram lines and from the wardrobe, pushed against one wall, there came a worried bleat. Don't chop down the wardrobe, begged the ghost. Don't chop. I'm not going to chop it down, said Dora for the hundredth time. It's trees they chop down and you're not in a tree. They had passed the prison and the football ground. Not much further to go. Well, I've done it now, thought Dora. And even if I don't meet Hecky, I can still do some good here. There must be lots of wicked people left in Wellbridge, even after Hecky's finished with the place. But, oh, if only I met her. If only we became friends again. The lorry stopped at the lights, just a few metres away, facing in the other direction, was a blue van with sealed windows. Inside it, sat Hecky holding the Wellington boot with the fish in it. Oh, if only Dora was here, she was thinking just at that moment. If only I had her to help me instead of these useless moaners. Then the lights change. The vans move forward and neither of the witches knew how close to each other they had been. Chapter 11 Daniel never quarrelled with Sumi. She was so gentle and so sensible that he wouldn't have known how to begin. But after Ralph Ticker was changed, they came as close to quarrelling as they'd ever done. Well, I still don't think it's right, she said. I think it's dangerous changing animals into people into animals, and I don't think Hecky should do it. They were in her parents' grocery shop parceling up black-eyed beans and Daniel was so cross he let the beans spill from his shovel way past the correct weight. I suppose you think it's right to torture 4,000 chickens and then plan to murder them in cold blood. No, I don't. You know I don't. But he could have been sent to prison and... He couldn't, said Daniel angrily. The RSPCA kept trying and all he got was a measly fine. And anyway, I don't see that it's so terrible being an unusual fish. Being an ordinary fish might be, but he isn't. People have been coming from all over the country to find out what he is. And I should think it's very exciting. This was true. The fish that Hecky had left in a tank by the great by the west gate of the zoo labelled another present from a well-wisher had really brought the scientists running. Sumi didn't say any more. She knew how Daniel felt about Hecky and she knew why. If you had a mother who had written seven books about the meaning of meaning and had no time for you, you might well turn to a warm-hearted witch for the love you didn't get at home. And quite soon, they had something more to worry them 
than whether Ralph Ticker did or did not like being an unusual fish. Although she was so busy doing good, Hecky never forgot her pet shop. Since she knew so much about animals, all the rabbits and guinea pigs she sold were healthy, so she made quite a lot of money. At first, she had kept this money in her mattress, but she was worried that the mice who lived there would nibble it, and this would be bad for them. Mice have very tender stomachs, she told the children. Not everyone knows that, but it's true. So she went to the bank and signed a lot of papers, and after that, every Friday afternoon, she paid in her takings. Hecky liked going to the bank. She enjoyed chatting with the other shopkeepers and the people in the queue. It made her feel ordinary, and that is a thing that witches do not often feel. On the particular Friday when something unexpected happened at the bank, Hecky found herself standing beside a tall and very distinguished looking man with a Roman nose, dark eyes set very close together, and a little beard like goats have. He wore a black coat with a fur collar and carried an ivory cane, and Hecky thought she had never seen anyone more handsome. She didn't approve of the fur collar, but there was always a hope that the raccoon it was made of had died in his sleep and no one is perfect. So she gave him a beaming smile, showing all her large and sticking out teeth. And when he got to the counter, she listened carefully as the clerk said, Good morning, Mr. Knapsack, and thought what an unusual name Knapsack was and how well it suited him. Mr. Knapsack wasn't putting money into the bank, he was taking it out. And as she waited, she squinted over his shoulder at his checkbook and saw his initial was L. Did that stand for Lucian or Lancelot or Lovelace? Such an elegant man was sure to have an unusual name. Mr. Knapsack took his money and Hecky smiled at him again, but he didn't smile back. Then it was her turn. She had just put her pay and in book down on the counter when the door burst open and a masked man rushed into the bank waving a sawn off shotgun. Everybody on the floor, he shouted to the people in the queue. Everybody got down at once, even Hecky, who had become very excited. She had seen bank robbers on the telly, but never in real life. This one looked a bit thin, and she thought he might have a hungry wife and children at home, or perhaps he was going to give the money to the poor like Robin Hood. Anyone who moves gets it, the robber went on, and strode to the counter. Outside, Hecky could see a van parked alongside the curb, and a fierce-looking man inside. The getaway car, really? It was just like the telly. Mr. Naksap was lying on the floor beside Hecky, did not seem to be excited at all. He looked quite green and his beautiful bowler hat had rolled away. Hecky wanted to comfort him, but she thought it was best to keep quiet till the robber had gone. Come on, hand it over, the lot, and hurry, barked the robber. Hecky squinted up and saw a little fat cashier run up to the grill with wads of banknotes and start pushing them through. Don't shoot, he kept saying, don't shoot. The other cashiers were huddled together at the back, all except one girl. A very young girl with long blonde hair who looked as though she had only just left school. She was edging her way carefully forward to where the alarm bell was. She had almost reached it. The next second, there was a blast from the shotgun, a scream, and the blonde girl fell across her desk with blood streaming from her shoulder. Up to now, Hecky had just been interested. Of course, it was wrong to rob banks. But after all, if there was one thing banks had plenty of, it was money. But now, she lost her temper. Her eyes narrowed. Her knuckles throbbed. She kicked off her shoe. The robber, meanwhile, had turned away from the counter. He felt in his pocket and lobbed a metal canister onto the floor where the people were lying. It was a smoke bomb. And as the choking fumes spread through the room, he made for the door. At least he started off. 
but a hand had fastened round his ankle, a hand like a steel trap. He raised his gun, ready to shoot, but he didn't seem to have arms anymore. He didn't seem to have anything. No one else saw as they groped and struggled to the exit. They thought that the robber had escaped, but Mr. Knapsack, lying beside Hecky, had seen. He had seen the robber's shape become dim, become wavery, shrink almost to nothing, and then reform in the shape of a small brown mouse, which scampered over to the wall panelling and was gone. Mr. Naxap's Christian name was not Lancelot or Lucian, it was Lionel, and the raccoon on his collar had not died in its sleep because Mr. Naxack was a furrier. He owned a shop in Market Square where he sold fur coats, and he had a workshop in the basement and a storeroom where he kept the skins of dead animals ready to be made up into coats or sold to other fur fur furriers at a profit. The shop was called Naxack and Naxack, but the first Naxack, who had been Mr. Naxack's father, was now dead. The old man had been a good craftsman and had made very beautiful coats which ladies had paid good money for because in those days people did not think it was cruel to kill an animal simply for its skin and there were not so many other ways of keeping warm. But his son Lionel Natsat was not a good craftsman. His coats were badly made. And at the time he took over, people were beginning to ask annoying questions before they bought fur coats. They wanted to know how the animals had been killed. Had they suffered at all? And were they rare? Because if so, they didn't want to wear them. So Mr. Naxa found himself getting poorer and poorer. And as he was a man who had expensive tastes, he didn't like this at all. In the basement, he had kept two ladies who made coats for him. Now he sacked them and started doing business with very dubious people. These were men who came at night and talked to him in the shop with the shutters closed, and they wanted him to get skins for them that were no longer allowed to be sold in England. The skins of Sumatran tigers or jaguars from the Amazon. Beautiful animals that were almost extinct. They were willing to pay thousands of pounds for pelts like that because they were always vain. They were always vain or ridiculous people who would do anything to lie on a tiger skin or wear a coat like no other in the world. But it wasn't easy to get hold of such skins. Mr. Knapsack was finding it very hard to supply his customers and he had been getting into debt. And then he saw Hecky fasten her hands round the bank robber's ankle and realised that he had been lying next to a very powerful witch. A witch who could change people into animals. But any animal? Mr Naxap meant to find out. Chapter 12 Hecky was worrying about the mouse. Suppose they set mouse traps in the bank and it got caught. Or killed, she said, looking desperate. Imagine it, an animal I produce lying dead. I had no time to think, you see, but that's no excuse. I'm sure they don't use traps, said Daniel. I've never seen a mouse trap in a bank. It'll be very perfectly happy behind the panel in eating the crumbs from the cashier's sandwiches, said Sumi. But it was hard to comfort Hecky. Dora had known how to do it. She'd just told Hecky to shut up and not be so daft. But the children couldn't do that. And Hecky went on pacing up and down and saying that if anybody she'd changed into an animal got hurt, she'd never know another moment's happiness again. Why don't we take the drag worm for a walk, said Joe, who was used to dealing with gorillas when they went over the top. Then you can go to the bank and ask about mouse traps. Hecky thought this was a good idea. She wanted to inquire anyway about the girl who'd been shot in the shoulder. As for the drag worm, he only had to hear the word walk and he was already inside the tartan shopping basket on wheels. 
It fitted in just like a house with a roof, and he was never happier than when he was rattling and bumping through the streets of Wellbridge. When they had gone, Hecky went to change her batskin robe for something more suitable, but she never got to the bank, for just then the doorbell rang. Out in the hall, holding a bunch of flowers, stood the tall, distinguished man that Hecky had seen in the bank. Forgive me for calling, he said. My name is Knapsack, Lionel Knapsack. May I come in? Mr Knapsack was wearing his dark coat with the raccoon collar and his bowler hat and smelled, smelled strongly of a toilet water called mail. Yes, please do. Hecky was quite overcome. I was just going to change. You look delightful as you are, said Mr Knapsack in an oily voice and handed her the flowers which she had stolen from the garden of an old lady who was blind. I came to congratulate you. I saw you see. I saw what you did in the bank. And as Hecky frowned, but don't worry, Miss uh, Tembury Smith, your secret is safe with me. Hecky now offered him a cup of tea. This time she put in three tea bags because she had never been alone before with such a handsome gentleman. But Mr. Knapsack said that was just how he liked it. Tell me, he said, resting his cup genteelly on his knee. Can you turn people into any kind of animal or only little things like mice? Oh, yes. Pretty well any animal, said Hecky, looking modest. But of course, I have to think of what will happen to it afterwards. Mr. Knapsack's eyes glittered with excitement. Could you, for example, could you, say, turn someone into a tiger, a large tiger? Hecky nodded. I'd have to make sure they wanted a tiger in the zoo. She then went on to tell the farrier of her plans for making Wellbridge a better place. I have such wonderful helpers, wizards and witches and children, the children in particular, and a most wonderful familiar, a drag worm. He's just out for a walk, but you must meet him. He's a wickedness detector, and he can sniff out even the tiniest bit of evil. Mr. Naxa didn't like the sound of that at all. I'm afraid I'm completely allergic to dragons and uh, worms. What I mean is I can't bear to be in the same room. When I was small, I had asthma, you see. I couldn't get my breath and the doctors told me that if I went near anything uh, like the thing you have described, I would simply choke to death. Hecky was very disappointed. She had set her heart on showing the drag worm to this attractive man. But of course, the idea of Lionel Knapsack choking to death was too horrible to think about. Mr. Knapsack, in the meantime, was doing sums in his head. A tiger skin fetched over £2,000. Even after he'd paid someone to kill and skin, skin the beast, it'd be a nice profit and plenty more where that came from. Ocelots, jaguars, lynx. All he had to do was butter up this frumpy witch. Dear Miss Tembury Smith. Hecky, please call me Hecky. Mr. Natsack gulped. Dear Hecky, I wonder if you would care to have dinner with me next Saturday at the Trocadero at eight o'clock. And that is where I'm leaving it for today.